Welcome to SFL This Week. We are your April Fools alongside the guy in charge. That's me. He's the guy at large, Chris Curtis. Chris, did they uh, did they catch you for stealing that self-driving car yet? <laughs> I... uh, no, not yet. Okay. Not yet. I'm not sure. It, only because uh, the self-driving car knew where it was going to avoid the problem. Um, I have no idea where I'm at. <laughs> it's a desperate situation out there. But, hey, we've made it to uh, the end of week 12 in SFL season 22 and uh, heading into an, and what's going to be an epic week 13 of season 22 and chris curtis is here uh in uh, in for mike o'neill tonight uh, we wish mike o'neill the very best and uh yeah it's great to have you here curtis for the first time this season to uh, break yeah. down the week yeah it was a good week of action uh less games than the normal slate but uh, no shortage of action really across the schedule so some really good games and really good individual performances as well i know that uh you're a little bit taller on screen than i am right now it's definitely not yeah, affecting. It's definitely not giving me a complex at all um, as the leader better. of the league. Uh, you just look sad. Just go back to where you were. <laughs> all right, let's go to the headlines for week 12. <laughs> Clinching, we had a bunch of that this week. Minnesota wrapped up the Central again while Fort Worth uh, claimed the South. Four in a row for Carolina. They take care of business again and now waits two weeks for Florida and a potential playoff run. The Mexico City Aztecs are ascending. Very nice Vice Wars 2.0 tribute this week as well. Uh, their offense turned it on, improving to 5-5, five and five, but will it be enough to boost a playoff run? We'll get into uh, all the specifics of where the playoffs stand today. Spoiling the finish to the Portland Fleet at Evo 9X Stadium. Los Angeles gets bold, knocks off the fleet in Portland's final home game, and coming up next week on Sunday, 10-0, Versus 10 and 0, Canton will face Florida in a battle between old and new superstars. What caught your eye in Week 12, Curtis? Uh, looking at the Aztecs, that's my that's my where my eyes at right now. They absolutely took a paddle to Denver this week, and uh, Jordan Sight playing very well, as well as the Mexico City defense, which uh, really shined this week against the Nightwings. Well, I'm glad that uh, your eyes didn't go to Carolina because that gives me an opportunity to uh, talk about Carolina. When Carolina, <laughs> when Carolina fell to two and five, we looked at the schedule and we said, "Hey, these are all very winnable games." Yeah. Uh, and it's tough to win the games you're supposed to win in the SFL and collect those wins, but that's what Carolina did. They uh, they rolled through the easy part of their schedule and now uh, get a favorable bye week situation. Uh, to get a couple of weeks to prepare for Florida. I'm sure your eyes will be glued to that Florida-Canton game as well to see what Canton can do with them. But uh, should be an exciting Week 13. What do you think? Should we get to the highlights? I think so. Let's get it rolling. All right. Well, we have to start in Tulsa where we had a, a tremendous game. Curtis, you were on the call for that game, if I, yes. do, uh, if I do believe. D.C. Mm -hmm. and Tulsa. So you'll be very familiar with this one. It was all D.C. early. Shabazz Synergy having all kinds of time in the pocket finds Lauren Burkoko. That goes right between the hands of Cameron Shaw in the back of the end zone to give DC a 7-0 lead. Look at the run DCD situation that Coach Mullinex has. That is fantastic. Hey, look at that. Give me that. Peanuts say, wow, off the deflection from Tyler Highfield. Makes the one-handed snag. That was pretty as DC halfway through the second quarter uh, is in business. Out of the gun, 10-0. This right before the half. This was a huge stop for Tulsa. Finally felt like they had some momentum early, but uh, Curtis DC came right out in the second half and scored again. Yeah, they did, and this is this is the mark of a good team. Even when the even when the momentum reverses to the opposition, you see that uh, that Chuck Steller and company with DC knows how to put the ball in the end zone, knows how to put the other team on their back once more with some haymakers. And this was the first sign of life from Tulsa. 5.30 to go in the third quarter, 20-7. to 7. DC now up 13, but on the very next series, in fact, the very next play, Lyric Da Vinci, how to get so wide open, they're back up by 20. Yeah, a little bit of over-aggression from the the Tulsa defenders. The safeties came up, and Lyric Da Vinci with a post route just over the middle was able to sneak behind them. Great job by Synergy to avoid the pressure and take out the uh, take out the chance to get them deep over the middle of the field. 
So third down and seven for Tulsa, back down by 20. They need something to happen, and Tyler Highfield gets the sack. Is this guy the defensive rookie of the year, perhaps, or what? How about Travis Arthur, though? He says, hey, I'll raise your sack, and I'll get a pick six, outrunning all the big guys and Lauren Prococo down the field. We got a game, 27-14, Tulsa we thundering back at a five and four record trying to make a statement after a couple major wins flip out to phoenix jones and yes just beyond the pylon that ball strikes eight minutes to go and now it's just a six point game but with 108 to go in the fourth quarter time is running out on the desperados michael brown trying to make things happen gets it over to bandit to the 41 yard line and the desperados would keep it moving Brown again, back to pass from the DC 35, caught again to Hume at the 17 yard line. 30 seconds to go, Tulsa no timeouts. They've got a chance to get the game ceiling touchdown. But it's Michael Brown to Tyler Highfield. And Highfield with the spin move, runs out the clock the new school way with the pick six, can you believe it? It, just another case of him being the uh, the defensive rookie of the season, and he has he's been a an electric player for DC on the defensive side of the ball. He also had the tip on the peanut say interception earlier on in the game. He's been very good. DC's very good finding ways to win even when their backs are up against the wall. And it, make no mistake, it was very much up against the wall in that contest. So DC now eight and two. They will take on Baltimore six and four. The Vultures have never lost more than four games in a regular season and they haven't lost to dc in quite some time the the vultures have had their number these games are typically wild shootouts and baltimore has come out victorious certainly as of late the vultures also have fort worth in week 14 so this is not an easy stretch it is not a guarantee for the vultures but they are playing pretty good football how do you see this playing out this go around because uh, dc's got all the momentum right now DC has a lot of momentum, but uh, but Baltimore also knows how to win in clutch situations, especially at the end of the season. This is this is shaping up to be a crazy last couple weeks for those two teams in particular as they battle for playoff positioning or even to get into the playoffs. Baltimore in danger of not making it if they stumble over these next two weeks. So this is, I mean, that DC Baltimore game that is absolutely eyes glued to the uh, screen to figure out exactly what's going to happen there and baltimore certainly has their work cut out for them this season that's a sneaky good game more on week 13 later in the show back to the highlights let's go to raleigh where the skyhawks were hosting the uh, motor city v8s and vince desantis gets loose we pick it up in the second quarter the v8s up seven to three carolina got going a little slow in this one but the skyhawks whole mantra has been finishing football games uh, and uh, just before the end of the first half, they finished this one off well. Matt South fires to Chase Earl for the score. Skyhawks go up 17 to 10. But Motor City was not done. The although the uh, Skyhawk faithful was making it certainly difficult on them. King Jackson just before the half is going to find a wide open Phil Koss into field goal range. And just before the break, Motor City adds a field goal to make it 17 to 13 at the half. Now King Jackson rolling and throwing to Tristan Hatley. Carolina with the interception. Hatley down the sideline. And that was how we started the second half. And that's when Red Shoes got involved. Ike McBride, <laughs> women power into the end zone, 24-13. Skyhawks up 11. Now King Jackson trying again to get uh, down the field. And Skippy Curtis with the interception. Women power. Carolina being fueled in the second half by the ladies as they take an 11-point advantage. Second down and goal. It's Ike McBride, women power, into the end zone, 31-13, <laughs> Carolina. And uh, Ike celebrates, so does the cheerleader. I can't even run, let alone do whatever that was about to be. <laughs> Carolina up 18, Motor City wouldn't go away. King Jackson fires to Guy Clausen in the end zone, so it's 31-20 to now in the fourth quarter. Motor City trying to make a game of it, but on fourth and short, Curtis, that's not going to get it done. Great open field tackle, Skyhawks win. 34 to 20, you're on Carolina. What have you seen out of your team in the last month that's different? 
Uh, four weeks of wins and four weeks of Matt South playing very good, responsible football. That's the biggest thing that I've noticed. And the ball hawking secondary for the for the Skyhawks as well has been very nice. You have uh, Delro, you have Alan England, you have Skippy Curtis who got in the act this week. And then you have Tristan Hatley who's been a ball hawking cornerback for most of his SFL career. But the biggest thing is Matt South. This team's success will live and die by how he takes care of the football. In the last four wins that they've had, two interceptions from Matt South over those four games. If he is throwing to the correct uniforms, then this team has a chance to win week in and week out. You saw Ike McBride, Skippy Curtis yeah. featured there in the highlight reel. It's honestly genuinely upsetting, Curtis, that we don't have more women in the league because there's really no reason uh, that we don't have more women in the league. And so it's, it's always great to not only uh, watch them on the field, but watch them play well. I mean, Carolina yeah. uh, led, especially by Ike McBride. Uh, she has been the finisher. I don't know if that's her mm -hmm. nickname, but like she is probably the best fourth quarter running back in the SFL right now. Inside of 10 yards, she is the one to go to. She clicks her heels and there's no place like home. It's really, really nice to have Ike McBride in red and blue in the Skyhawks uniforms. A uh, quick shout out as well to um, uh, Skyhawks owners, uh, Harish Prasad and Shravan Prasad. Um, their dad, Chris Cross, um, is currently, ESC, and he's in medical attention right now. I don't want to go into too much detail, not my place, but I do want to send some prayers up for the Prasad family. Um, and make sure that they know that we're thinking about them. We're thinking of you, Prasad's, and, uh, you know, Florida will wait. That matchup just uh, is a couple weeks away. And uh, just uh, take care of your family. Be well. Mm -hmm. And we wish you all the best. Well done, Curtis. All right, back to the highlights. Let's go to Fort Worth, where the Louisiana Revolution were in town. And the Revolution have been down on their luck, scoring less than 14 points a game, the worst-rated offense in the SFL. But it was their defense early that kept them in this game. Gary Clem with a sack. Marcus Dunhill fires down the field. Pass caught by Hacker. That was the lone <laughs> bright spot for this offense as he spins away and scores. Puts Fort Worth up 10-0 with five minutes uh, five minutes into this game, and it felt like as Dunhill gets sacked again that Louisiana was going to collapse. I mean, Fort Worth was rolling just as a lot of the favorites did this week, but uh, Louisiana never buckled, and they actually played a pretty impressive game. Chris Crant Jr. getting into the end zone for the touchdown here. Yeah, exactly. Louisiana, not a team that's going to lay down. Gerald Smith, too proud, and that Louisiana staff, too proud to let Fort Worth roll them over. But uh, Fort Worth ended up being uh, just too much, especially on this play with the fumble on the sack. Red zone was key. They did overturn it, but it resulted in just a field goal. We go to the fourth quarter. Louisiana's down six. That pass was behind Mike Twinscrew. So you go back to the previous possession or the uh, previous highlight where Utah was hit in the red zone. They had to settle for a field goal. This time, only down six. He underthrows Mike Twinscrew, and that pass is picked off by Adam Leach. He takes it all the way back for a pick six to put Fort Worth up 26-13 to in the fourth quarter. Here we are again in the red zone. Louisiana just no quit in this ball game. Tommy Utah to Adam Banks didn't drop that one. The Revs struggled with drops in this game. Made it 26-20, 128 to go. Fort Worth trying to clinch the South Division with a win, and Louisiana gave them all they can handle. You never know in these Southern Division games, Curtis. They are always tight. This one, a bobbled onside kick recovery by Charlie Baker, but he makes it happen and makes it 26 to 20. So Fort Worth uh, wins the South title. Of course, they have defending MVP Delaney Nash on their squad. We've seen Marcus Dunhill set an SFL quarterback record for rushing yards in a game earlier this season against Mexico City. They've got Steven Hacker, one of the best receivers in the league. This team is a complete team. It's kind of surprising that they're only at three losses, but because they haven't had their last bye, already eight wins, uh, they're, they're in for another run for an SFL championship. As they should be. I mean, this is a team that does that didn't really go away. They're still a fantastic team uh, end over end. We had some doubts about them at the beginning of the season. I know week one didn't essentially go their way, if I remember correctly. And, you know, but they've they've battled back. Uh, Stephen Hacker and company, um, just very, very good team head to toe and looking really forward to seeing how far that team can go as they really are one of the more complete teams in the SFL offense, defense and special teams. They have it. So now they get a chance to prove it once again. 
Fort Worth was undefeated in last regular season. So when they lost that first one, everyone's kind of like, yeah. all right, well, that's game over. You know, <laughs> back back to normal. And Fort Worth's like, no, 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 no. We won no, overreactions. We're... Exactly. It was, <laughs> it was uh, definitely an SFL version of that. Shout out Rich Eisen. But, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, they, they are a, a, a wildly impressive team. They're going to be scary in the playoffs. They have not played, uh, they have not played Canton yet. Uh, I believe they lost to Florida early in the season. That was one of their uh, early losses. And uh, and so, you know, we'll see what uh, Fort Worth can do in the postseason. All right, uh, final highlight of the night because it was a short week and we had a lot of routes. We'll talk about those. But this was one of the best games the, of the SFL season that you probably not seen. Sully Richardson finds uh, Jack Flash with L.A. down 3-0. This was L.A.'s opening possession and they hand it off to Bren, uh, Brendan Brennanstall into the end zone for the score. L.A. goes up 7-3. to three. Portland's next possession, Cyrus Jive, rolls out. Look at that throw. The, po the positioning of that football, beautiful. To Cooper makes it 10-7 Portland. And Portland scores on their first two possessions. Cyrus Jive completed his first 11 passes. At this point in the game, he was 11 for 11. Neither team had a stop. Cyrus Jive, pump fakes, then gets uh, hit right up front, and Jive gets hurt. He would leave the game. He would not return. He finishes the night 11 for 11 passing. So O'Sullivan, the backup, comes in, and on the very next play, third down and 13, he scrambles away from pressure and throws a touchdown to Cooper. Portland takes the lead 17 to 10. They have scored on all three of their possessions. Next possession, Sully Richardson to Chris Lee, 17-17 just before the half. I mean, this, this game had it all. It was nuts. Start of the second half in the third quarter, Jalen Wells scores. LA goes for four and a half minutes, makes it 24 to 17. Likens on top. Then this game got defensive. 4.45 to go in the fourth, third down and goal. Handoff, Tazzy Blackwell with the stop at the three. Portland would go for it. And um, they would, uh, well, we'll find out, Curtis. But uh, you, you, you were calling this game alongside me. Watch the shovel, fourth and goal, it didn't work. Blackwell gets the stop. And L.A. gets the win, 24-17. to 17. This game was running in conjuncture to that D.C. Tulsa game, so neither of us really got to watch the, uh, each other's game. But uh, yeah. still, uh, a heck of a performance from Los Angeles. They scored on four of their six possessions. That's all the opportunities that they had in this game. It was a crazy one. It really was. And the thing is, is this is a, this is a nice win for L.A. looking towards the future. They're not going to be able to get into – the playoff situation this season, but uh, proving that they can win um, later in the season as they really start to figure themselves out, get their roster together and get things going, that bodes well for things in the future for this Lycans roster. Uh, Rochelle Colson and company over there, they do a really good job, not only with their players, but uh, but trying to figure, figure out how to put them in good positions to win. They've shown that later in this season. They did not start well, but they're finishing and hopefully they can get a better start to next season going into their game. So that said, go looking at Portland real quick. Cyrus Jive, the second time in his career, he's actually ended the game with a, um, well, actually first time he's ended the game with perfect completion percentage. The other one, he had 23 straight completions in the yeah. APF era um, and ended up 23 for 24, I believe is what it was, um, where a ball that was caught out of bounds ended that streak. So that he's... He's one of the streakier quarterbacks in the SFL, and it, it was kind of wild to see um, him put on that streak and then get hurt. That was a big blow to the Portland offense. Ironically, I think I think I was on the call for that game too. It was uh, it was a just a wild turn of events there for Cyrus Jive. And look, Cyrus Jive's been active in the community. I'm looking for a new home, right? I want to yeah. be a starting quarterback. I can be a starting quarterback. He's proven that time and time again um, in Portland, dis despite maybe the lack of wins in Portland. Uh, Cyrus Jive, uh, he, he, he has put together some phenomenal tape in his mm -hmm. short SFL career. Okay, so we've gone through some of the games that uh, were awesome. Uh, there were some games that were not awesome this week. Canton, 47-3 against San Diego. Minnesota, 35-6 over Arizona. They clinched the Central. Mexico City, excuse me, 47-10 over Denver and Florida 31 nothing over Jacksonville huge shout out to Brenda Puff who you see uh, uh, pictured she extended so far for a one-handed interception her first career pick that I couldn't even get 
three of her four limbs on camera. Like, it was a, a crazy play, one of the best plays of the season uh, in the loss, unfortunately, for Denver. But shout out to Brenda Puff for that. Where do you want to start uh, with these uh, these shellackings, Curtis? Because it, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, I want to start, honestly, with Arizona, um, Minnesota and Arizona. Minnesota wins. They move forward. But then Arizona, who desperate times, desperate measures for that Scorpions team is they have not been um, they have not been playing up to their potential of late. And I they're they're not even in the playoff picture right now. Yeah, th- that defense is just not it's just not there. You know, mm-hmm. it's they're just not getting stops. Uh, Portland hung 27 on them in an overtime win the week before. Uh, it's been a struggle. Minnesota continues to roll. Uh, Curtis, Canton wins 47-3. But I got to say, I mean, San Diego made it easy on them. They just did not give Johnny Pickler any protection. There, there were no – it was a lot of spread offense, and Canton just totally exploited that. Kevin Brackett, six sacks. Six. He had two yeah. uh, in his first nine games. He had an incredible – game he also blew up a pitch play that ended up being a fumble return for a touchdown for Canton once again Canton scored 27 of their 47 points off of turnovers Uh, San Diego made it easy on them that's the second time in three weeks that San Diego has been blown out they got blown out by Seattle a couple of weeks ago five dollar super chat from Sultan we're looking to shock the SFL next season Uh, that's uh, Sully Richardson hashtag new moon so uh yeah, I agree. I, I, I hope that uh, Los Angeles uh, turns it around there. But but back to back to uh, Canton and San Diego, Curtis. I, I'm really compelled uh, to see what Florida does this week. But uh, yeah, I think San Diego's probably kicking themselves that they didn't give Pickler a little bit more protection. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and Canton, though, th- that's what they do is they go through and they force opposing quarterbacks and opposing offenses into bad situations. Turnovers are the name of their game and points off of them are how they really steal momentum and take it away and not give it back. So it's not not something we haven't seen from Canton before. San Diego did not make it easy on themselves, as you mentioned. And now Canton goes into an absolute showdown with Florida this coming week. And this is, I mean, 10-0 and 0 versus 10-0. and 0. There's not a lot more to say to hype that up, but both teams have absolutely circled this on their schedule and have had a circle for a long time. You see in gold there, the last two weeks, these two teams combined have given up six points and zero touchdowns. Florida has shut out teams back-to-back. Now, it is Denver and Jacksonville. Okay, so, so you know, let's put a, put a pump, pump the brakes on that. But still, very impressive. And that headlines week 13. We have some sensational matchups next week, and it was worth a look uh, in totality. Let's start in the center there, Curtis, with Florida and Canton. I mean, are, are the two offenses going to just explode? Like, combust in the middle of the field? I don't know how anybody's going to get a first down in this game. Well, you'd think, but I mean, essentially, it's it's going to be whoever blinks first in a lot of cases. The thing is, uh, both teams are very good at keeping momentum. Both teams are very good at holding opponents to nothing on the offensive side. So the first defense to blink and give up maybe the first big play is really going... I, I don't expect this to be a 9-6 to six game. This is going to be somewhere in the in the twenties, I think, um, on uh, on each side before we get to the end of it. But it's just a a real big time showdown between two teams full of playmakers and the big stars, the superstars on both these rosters will determine who wins this game and uh, and who remains undefeated for the season. It's you know you pay, you pay those players to be electric. You pay those players to make an impact. It, pardon the pun, that's exactly what one of these teams is going to do bigger than the other, and that's going to be who decides it. All right, so let's go to Friday. Four teams, yeah. it's a mess. Five and five yeah. is a mess right now, and four of them, now Atlanta's going to play tonight, so they'll either be six and five or, or five and six, but four of them will be in action. San Diego at Tulsa, Charleston at Atlanta. My early gut reaction tells me that Tulsa and Charleston – are the favorites in those games just because uh, they have some forward momentum. Uh, But either way, I mean, it's anybody's game out there. And when you look at the standings, six and six could do it, right? Could, but seven and five should do it. And that means that all these teams want to win out. And that's what they're looking at uh, heading into Friday. It's going to be exciting. It is. I mean, you got maybe one spot, one spot at six losses to be able to get in. And that's a maybe. You need some pretty good calculations to be able to make that happen come the scenarios. And 
the rest of them i mean if you can get to seven wins you at least you give yourself a better shot at getting into the big dance come the end of the season it's a uh it's a dog eat dog world essentially for these five and five teams that need to get themselves going and giving that sixth win keeping yourself at five losses is absolutely paramount for those four teams in particular but there's there's still so much mess to clean up in the middle of those standings and at the back of the pack in the playoff standings there's a lot to be determined over these last couple weeks and week 13 is no exception now saturday we uh, baltimore visits dc we talked about that a little bit earlier but seattle also tries to clinch the pacific against vancouver if they do that we will head into week 14 with no divisions up for grabs it's been a long time since that's happened in the sfl but if vancouver wins the whole thing is i mean the the, the card is flipped it's pandemonium <laughs> it's chaos in the pacific division um I, I, how do you see that one going down Honestly, I know that Vancouver has not had the greatest season, and I think they'd be the first to tell you that. They have missed out on some opportunities to really flip the script because they, they did not start well, and they have not necessarily finished very well either, but they do have a few key wins. That said, Seattle has been one of the more consistent teams and probably the most consistent team in that Pacific division. They had a couple of, uh, of blurps earlier on, but uh, have remained better than most in those uh, in those kind of situations seattle i think uh, will eventually win out the pacific division um i and that's with love to vancouver obviously being uh formerly from that team but uh seattle i think just too strong this season uh, a lot of playmakers for over there and they are gaining a valuable experience as to how to win in close situations close games now is the next step for them to learn how to win in the playoffs um, that'll be tough for them, um, but they I, I think they do have the gumption in that locker room and in that staff to be able to make it happen. Vancouver uh, has never missed the playoffs, right, Curtis? Yeah. Uh, no, I so, don't think they have. Yeah, so that's, um, that's, that's a big one for them. Seattle's had a couple of weeks, or I'm sorry, Vancouver's had a couple of weeks to prepare for that game um, as well, coming off the bye. Sunday, Arizona is 5-6. and six. Shout out to Ashley Jackson, who did across over the 40,000 yard milestone um that's uh, fourth best in the SFL all time uh but Arizona at five and six I don't know if it's going to happen Curtis their SOV is not that great um they play Houston they would love a Houston win tonight uh to help boost that SOV ironically uh they're needing Baltimore to win out because uh, <laughs> because Arizona beat Baltimore earlier this season and so um you know that's 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 terrible to say if you're an Arizona Scorpion <laughs> because you never, ever, ever cheer for Baltimore. Uh, but that's what's at, on st uh, at stake on Sunday. And then Mexico City, Alamo City, two teams in the South. We know they're going to beat each other up. Somebody's going to get to 6-5, and five and someone's hopes are probably going to be dashed. Uh, in Mexico City's case, I think they pretty much have to win out because their resume is just not as stacked as some other teams. Yeah, their SOV not as strong, um, and and really they they have to get themselves record wise into a position to take advantage of some of some slip ups by other teams in their echelon. So uh, Mexico City needs to win out there. They're the team that really I'm watching for um, of the uh, of the remaining teams that are in the hunt because their offense has played spectacularly well. We saw uh, Jordan Scythe do really really well. He's been very good last couple of weeks as well in their two straight wins. So I, I look for that team to make an impact as well. Alamo City needs some help, but they're not out of it. Um, but uh, I, I really think Mexico City wins out there. Our Monday night spectacular next week on this total solar eclipse night, the Ramblers at four and six who are possibly working on some total solar eclipse uniforms for this game, taking on their arch rival, the Minnesota legend who are eight and two and still fighting to retain a first round buy in the playoffs. That's significant because Minnesota's never even won a playoff game. So uh, they would get a buy into the quarterfinals to try and win their first there. This game is always fun and exciting and low key Indianapolis does have a legit playoff chance at four and six. Their SOV is 416. If they beat Minnesota, that's really going to ramp up uh, their chances. Then they have San Diego in week 14. So uh, it's 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 actually it's there, Curtis. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's one of the teams at six and six that could eat that spot at six and six to get in. 
and the and them having a 416 on those four wins you beat minnesota that puts your sov probably over the 500 mark so that's a that's a big big game for them and and then san diego is not a game that um that is unwinnable for the for the ramblers as well so they're not out of it by any stretch um san diego's definitely slipped up on more than one occasion this season so look for them to look for uh over the last couple weeks indy to really make a statement but they need to start against minnesota that's a must-win game for them so here's how the playoff picture looks now uh canton is slightly ahead of florida sov still determining that but obviously head-to-head is gonna matter in that case when it's all said and done uh dc is still in fourth because uh they're gonna need a better record than minnesota as a non-division winner they cannot win the North because Canton won the head-to-head earlier this season, albeit in a close one. Fort Worth is uh, still at 8-3 and three, um, with their uh, in, the, in the five seed. And then Seattle, a distant sixth, uh, a game and a half back of the Toros. Baltimore slotted in seventh. Houston is currently in eighth. They are on the Monday Night Spectacular in about 15 minutes. Atlanta is also on the MNS uh, uh, coming up here the 14 seed at five and five. You see all those five and five teams. There's two actually not even on the graphic, Vancouver and Mexico City with uh, the lower SOVs. Seven teams at five and five, eight teams with five losses as Carolina is on a bye. And then even Charleston and Tulsa have five common opponents and that's the same record. And then when you look at their SOV, Charleston has a .001 advantage over Tulsa and is currently in the 10 spot it doesn't get tighter than that uh what catches your eye Curtis about where we stand right now uh as of right now this game that we're about to have with Atlanta I mean they win tonight and they vault themselves uh possibly as high as nine if my calculations are correct here um but the because they're they put themselves a six wins they own a head-to-head over Carolina right now so that is a that's a big game tonight if they are to beat Houston and Houston should they lose they slip oh. possibly as low as what 11 a nightmare it's a disaster well yeah. they i mean they would go to 5 and 5 they could fall all the way to the bottom of the 5 and 5 teams depending yeah. upon where their SOV is i mean it would be it would really be um, a bad a bad thing for both teams honestly this is a playoff game tonight Curtis because if Atlanta mm-hmm. with that uh fifth best sov amongst five lost teams right now at six and six it's just not looking good for them so uh, i think i mean both obviously houston has three more games left in their schedule so there's a little bit less urgency but i mean it's basically a tie both of them need a win yeah. badly well and if houston were to win tonight do you know offhand if they have a stronger sov than baltimore i do not have it pulled up right now okay but you're but That'd i mean you're right you're in and it could be common games as well um, I don't believe that uh, they have played this season, but uh, okay. it, yeah, I mean, I mean, it gets it clears them of the mess below yeah. them, and that would be uh, that would be huge for them. All right, uh, let's get into tonight's game, Atlanta and Houston, and and let's take a look at uh, this series history. Houston leads two to one. This is a crazy stat. This is the first game that Atlanta has gone to Houston since season eight. How's it even possible? That is a crazy quirk in the schedule. So it's been a long time since we saw Atlanta and Houston. All three meetings have been decided by one score. Atlanta's lost two straight. Houston's lost three straight. Both these teams in desperate need of a win uh, because not only would a loss really hurt their uh, postseason chances, but it would also keep them on that losing streak as well, and nobody wants that heading into the playoffs couple of receivers uh, set to hit milestones. Boot Chisholm still looking for that touchdown. He is one away from 100. He has been most of the season. And Mike St. Green is one away from 50 um, in his career. So we'll be on a lookout uh, for those guys. This should be uh, a close game, a tight game. And uh, that uh, will be displayed here uh, right now with Haynes' vision. And we're going to take a more in-depth look at uh, these plays and break them down live in real time for you, Curtis. And we'll first start with uh, what Atlanta does well as we see Shine coming off the edge. Yeah, he's going to be the one that is going to make the impact here. And Atlanta does a really good job coming off the edge, disguising their rushes on the defensive line and Shine's the beneficiary on that play, but really sending their, their linemen to different spots 
and it really makes a difference for that Atlanta defensive rush. Down the field, you can see Nathan Barnett on this play undercuts the route. That ball just a little bit uh, underthrown there. But Nathan Barnett, one of the players from Sioux Falls that Atlanta was able to pick up, kind of like Mexico City, uh, got a lot of Vegas guys. Atlanta uh, was uh, really keen on picking up some sparrows, and they have all made uh, some tremendous plays for them, including Kay Marion, who scores a touchdown here. Yeah, Kay Marion, one of the more electric players running the go routes or the post routes. Get her into space, get her into a spot where she can turn up field in the distance game. She is absolutely electric every time she gets a chance to touch the football. She did it in Sioux Falls, and she does it again on multiple occasions here for Atlanta. Max Jackson, a lot of risk reward. How about the strong safety here playing in the box? And look at him roam. Look at him get the tackle for loss there to force a fourth down. Atlanta would end up winning this game 20-17 uh, to 17 in part because of that tackle uh, that forced a field goal. Then uh, on third down and one, look at look at the beautiful Ron Haynes just does an incredible job. Look at the blocking okay. down the field. Yeah, exactly. You send tight ends and wide receivers out in front of BDG Hollywood and make him make space for himself in the second level. That is a recipe for success for Atlanta if you put the, the blocking in his hands. Atlanta does a lot of things well. Talon Steele is a secret weapon, and I don't know how he's a secret because he is a very large man, but, I mean, how does he get down the field that fast? And it takes <laughs> everything Liam Ryan has to bring him down. That's a look at... Uh, what Atlanta does well, thank you, Ron Haynes, for that. And now we go to Houston and the Headhunters, and uh, they've got a bunch of DBs and and just the whole defense, quite frankly, that flies all around the field. Yeah, they are very good at ball hawking in the secondary. Their eyes, you have three sets, four sets of eyes on the quarterback, but all of them instinctive enough to know where their charges are, where the receivers are, where the safety help is over the top. So the corners rely on the safeties, and the safeties very much rely on the corners too. KT Slayer at defensive tackle. Who says a defensive tackle can't make plays? <laughs> Untouched, beautiful move uh, around the edge, and uh, Houston's – pressure interior pressure has caused a lot of teams problems this season yeah i like the delay on that particular play too that's something that houston does with regularity to throw off the protection game let's take another look at this play from the tulsa game obviously you know tulsa's very good team uh this season but uh, jason peace and company have shut them them down and peace you know just sitting down in his own making sure that uh his uh, man in front of him doesn't make a play and then has the instinct to go and get that football and uh, here's some more blocking from the outside uh that both teams have have very potent outside running games but not in the traditional sense like right there curtis it's all about blocking it is it abs that absolutely sets up slap i could have scored on that with the blocking in front of me there <laughs> and the the biggest thing with slap he was a newcomer to the scene last season and he has really made a name for himself in Houston continues to do really well in his second season in the league in your self-driving car maybe you could have scored that <laughs> touchdown DR Sim scores and uh, at this point it was a wrap I mean Houston look like I said Tulsa's a really good team this season they're a top 12 team and Houston in this matchup really uh really just kind of dismantled them it was quite impressive Houston's going to need more of that out of their offense uh, here tonight. Charles Doherty is on the call with us. Tyler Falk, uh, weather permitting, hopefully. I know there's a lot of storms going on in Missouri uh, right now, so if any of you are in Missouri, um, that's great. One more thing before, or that's, I didn't, I said that's great as if that's that's the weather nerd in me coming out, like, ooh, there's stuff to talk about in <laughs> Missouri. It's not great. Hopefully Your storm Tyler's, chaser coming out again. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, uh, Tyler, I don't have the stones to go storm chasing. I just watch it on YouTube. But right. um, hopefully Tyler's all right, and he'll join us uh, for halftime and post game tonight. Charles Doherty will be on the call. One more thing before we leave the show, just before we, um, just before we got on the air, uh, we uh, got an announcement from the Alamo City Artillery Franchise. Of course, uh, Frank Wade, Gunny McGuire, congratulations to those guys taking over ownership. They're the current uh, owners of the uh, Bossier City Steamers down in the minor leagues. They're, it, it, uh, per the announcement, they're going to rebrand to the Red River Steamers in Season 24, which I absolutely love. Uh, we'll see Alamo City on the field again next season as that team prepares um, you know, for uh, their ascension into the SFL 
it's also so congrats to those guys it's also worth noting that um the teams that will be called up for portland and jacksonville that announcement will be made later this week um so uh, expect some big things out of the sfl in preparation for season 23 which starts at the sfl convention in houston in july uh curtis any thoughts on uh, the franchise movement around the league well, I mean, congrats to Red River Steamers coming up and, and taking the branding there. And uh, huge props to those guys for uh, taking the step that they needed. And then uh, looking forward to seeing what teams are coming up for the uh, the Portland and Jacksonville move-ons uh, after those are done. But the biggest thing now, if you are a uh, prospective owner in the SFL and want to get your team branding ready, I mean, there's yep. going to be some holes in the SFLM to now fill you got to backfill those to move those ones up. So this is this is the time you need to get those things ready, and proposals should be getting prepared. 2025 is when uh, we'll start to see those new teams in the SFLM. We'll probably uh, be doing some uh, some application processes in the uh, late fall as we mm -hmm. uh, prep for another uh, calendar year of SFL football. So, yeah, I mean, you've got plenty of time, six, seven months, put a bid together. I can't wait to see who's uh, going to be in this next group. Um, and maybe even some finalists from from last time coming back around and and getting their shot as well. So it's always it's always uh, exciting to see everybody get their shot and opportunity. But tonight, Houston and Atlanta get their shot at the playoffs. The Headhunters wearing NASA inspired uniforms tonight. They look so good, Curtis. I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm not an alternate uniform guy, but I want to buy that helmet. It it it's an incredible helmet. I can't wait to see uh, see Houston in those digs tonight. Yeah, they, they get a chance at, uh, at the game tonight. They get a chance uh, going against each other, two of the more storied franchises in the S in, in the lore of SFL from all the way to the beginning days. So a lot of fun to be had for both these teams and really a must-win game for both, and they're going to look good doing it. To infinity and beyond, we're ready to go here on Monday Night Spectacular. Houston and Atlanta coming up next. We'll see you then.